Can you give a round of applause to Ms. Rahana? So, when I saw the first patient uh, was crying together with Ms. Rahana on the stage, and I saw half of the audience were trying to keep their tears from flowing, and another half is actually weeping. So I know that uh, our patient is you know, able to touch our heart in a very special way, and uh, we believe that our heart is still intact, live and kicking. Uh, and we believe that humanity does still exist. Huh? Okay. Inshallah, thank you, um, Sister Rahana, for the beautiful moment that, that we sh shared with us. Okay, before we proceed to our next slot, I would like to uh, invite Datin Sri Haja Azlin Hezri, accompanying by Dr. Isha and Sis Rohana for refreshment. Okay. Why oh, you want to stay? Okay, we then we continue our uh, another session before we stop for um, lunch. Uh, the slot number three is by Puan Suzal Ashima Sulaiman. She's a nursing manager of Al Islam Specialist Hospital, and she'll be talking on a clinical assessment and nursing role in implementation of spiritual support service. Patafadol Mashkura. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya ibar musalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa ahlul unlatan min lithani yafqahu qawli. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Actually, Dr. Isha nak saya cakap bahasa Inggeris. Saya boleh je dua-dua. Tapi saya fasih bahasa Melayu. <laughs> but it's okay, my slide will be in English. But my explanation will be in Bahasa, insyaAllah. But because I hope, apa yang saya sampaikan ni, lebih difahami. Saya akan, slide saya bahasa Inggeris ni, buat explanation, ada yang bahasa, ada yang bahasa Inggeris. Is it okay? Kena saya fully in English. But feedback from you all juga mesti bahasa Inggeris. Sebab saya punya slide satu ni je. Banyak pada question saja. Okay? Sebab when you talk about clinical assessment, saya rasa all the staff nurse lebih faham dari saya. Okay, thank you Dr. Azwan for a kind introduction of me. And... Uh, I also thank to Allah especially for the giving chance to work in Al-Islam because 
This station is more sharing station. Bukan kata saya nak kata, this is must. Because kita tahu, in Al-Islam, maybe we are setting up this. And also for our members like Pusrawi also. But we doesn't know how it works. But this is a um, uh, satu uh, sesi yang diperpulang untuk saya share what we have done in Islam, what we already implement in our uh, nursing setting or nursing unit. Okay, and of course, yesterday Dr. Isha already told us about spiritual care. This is an introduction, which is most of the patient. When we talk about nursing profession, nurses are supposed to give and provide holistic care from the physical, mental, and psychological. Ada tak yang lain daripada tu? Of course, spiritual. Berapa banyak hospital yang dah provide? So, macam mana dia nak implement pada patient-patient kita? Okay, but we are really doing it. Ada SOP ke tak? Our nurses follow ke tak? Baik. Berapa ramai staff nurse dalam ni? Angkat tangan. Yang pakai uniform, of course, tak boleh bohong. Okay, berapa orang staff nurse? Angkat tangan. From uh, which hospital? Selayang hospital? Put up your hands. Okay. Lagi? Pusrawi? Jangan tak ngaku. Azara? Ada. Okay. Staff nurse? Maybe my slide more to nursing. Tapi tak ada masalah sebab dia perlu untuk lain-lain unit juga. Secara overall. Okay. Saya ulang. I'm just repeat what Dr. Isak just say just now and yesterday. So, holistic nursing care. Of course, we integrate Islamic value in profession to get to achieve mardatillah. What is mardatillah? Apa tu mardatillah? Staff nurse? Reda Allah. So, macam mana kita nak capai mardatillah? Kita dah tahu nurse bertugas di hospital. Semalam pun dah ulang, Dr. Ustaz Zul pun dah cerita. Kalau kita cerita tentang cari makan, kita dapat makan. Tapi kalau kita cari rada Allah, kita dapat semua. Betul? Okay, the responsibility of nursing to integrate Islamic value in our profession. Itu je. And hopefully, by the end of the day, Dari sesi ni, ada sedikit gambaran yang boleh kita bawa pulang dan kita nak implement dekat unit kita. Itu je. Okay? So, my slide will be going very fast. So, saya tak akan lebih daripada pukul satu tengah hari sebab masing-masing dah lapar. Alright? So, untuk outline, overview, we will discuss about inpatient care, nursing procedure, doctor's round or bedside visit. ICU care, maternity, dialysis, pre and post operative care, terminal ill care, death and dying patients. So macam mana implementasi Islamic value in this situation? In the hospital setting. Hmm, minta maaf sebab mic ni dia turun sendiri. So for the purpose of my presentation, this presentation I would like to share what we have been done in Al-Islam. In Al-Islam. But mungkin ada sedikit yang boleh digunakan pakai untuk hospital masing-masing. For the inpatient care, usually we welcome a patient with smile and salam. Smile and salam. Baik. Mengapa kita jadi jururawat? Mengapa kita jadi jururawat? Why why we are choose to be a nurse? Anybody? Pardon? 
Tak ada kerja lain. We don't have a choice. This is the last choice. Biasa dengar kan? Baik. Matron. Ujung sekali pakai sepak mata. Can you share with us why you are here? Why you choose to be a nurse? Silakan, tafadhal. Why you choose to be a nurse? Um, Assalamualaikum dan selamat tengah hari ya. Uh, saya Metrono Salawati Ismail. Saya bertugas di Institut Kanser Negara. Saya datang untuk slot ni sebab saya nak tengok uh, Puan Rihanna punya slot lah bersama pesakit. Um, soalannya, why I become a nurse? Okay. Uh, secara jujurnya, betul. Eh? Macam yang syarah kita cakap, uh, dulu-dulu uh, tak tahu nak buat apa sebenarnya kerja. Eh? So itulah saya percaya dengan kadar dan kadar rezeki saya. Uh, macam ayah saya, ya, kami tak senang sebenarnya. Kami enam beradik, saya anak nombor dua. Um, adik kecil-kecil lagi. So masa tu zaman tahun 80-an ya, kita mengalami uh, kegawatan ekonomi ya, satu dunia. So masa tu kerja sangat susah. Cita-cita saya sebenarnya saya nak jadi pesyarah bahasa Inggeris. Pesyarah bahasa Inggeris dan saya bercita-cita untuk melanjutkan pelajaran ke overseas ya, ke UK. Tapi masa tu uh, ayah saja yang bekerja, mak tidak bekerja. So masa tu ada keluar iklan. Uh, zaman saya dulu siapa yang nak masuk nursing hanya yang dapat grade tiga eh, untuk apply. Uh, so bila saya pergi saya dapat grade satu dan saya punya result sangat bagus. Saya ditanya eh, oleh uh, interviewer tu dia kata, uh, kenapa anda nak jadi nurse? Anda punya keputusan SPM sangat bagus. Saya kata sebab saya nak tolong mak ayah saya. Sebab saya rasa sangat sedih sebab saya tengok bapa saya dia kaya basikal. Zaman dulu, dulu tak ada online eh, bila kita minta uh, kerja. So, kena ambil uh, surat, uh, apa ni, borang ya, eh, dekat pejabat pos. Isi ya, eh, uh, dengan SPA. Uh, kemudian, bila saya tengok susah payah tu, saya kata, oh, I have to do something. For my family lah, especially my parents. Eh. Um, so, of course, eh, saya ditawarkan tiga tahun. Saya keluar, saya terus dapat kerja. Eh, Alhamdulillah. Tapi prinsip saya macam ni. Uh, apa yang kita tak kenal, kita tak akan jatuh cinta. So, go for it, kerja. Dan sekarang saya jatuh cinta. Dan saya pun macam tak percaya. Eh, saya dah jadi matron. Daripada tak nak, tak nak. Eh. Daripada tak redo. Tapi sekarang Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Eh? Okay, terima kasih. Thank you, matron. So, anybody want to share? Ni sharing station. So, saya nak everybody share. Your experience, why you choose to be a nurse? Mostly, the answer is, we don't have a choice. Mostly, ada tak ada kat sini love about nursing? Mati hidup saya nak jadi nurse je. Tak boleh tidak. Ada? Please share. Ada tak? Ada seorang lagi nak nak share boleh? Ujung sana? Ah takut. Ada siapa nak share lagi? Kita ambil yang tengah. One of the sister from uh, Philippines, please share why you choose to be a nurse. You are Muslim. The microphone, please. Slide saya tak banyak. Sikit je. Because when we are talking about clinical assessment, how we are going to assess a patient, then implement ibadah to the patient. Yes, sister, please. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. I am from the Philippines. Why I became a nurse? Uh, it's not about a choice, but it's about... Uh, in our family, we are a family of uh, mostly are in medical professions. I guess I was raised up with with 
the idea that caring for people is very important and that if you want to be of significance, then you might as well choose or you might as well go into a profession that will help you do the best you can. So I enrolled into a nursing school and I became a nurse. So I see myself as doing the best I can and being significant to others in this profession. So that's the, the reason why I'm here. Thank you, sister. So anyone upstairs? The last one before we go into another slide. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Saya daripada Hospital Melaka. Actually, uh, saya sebenarnya masuk jururawat adalah atas permintaan mak saya. Saya sebenarnya ingin menjadi tentera udara. Oh. Dan saya pun telah dapat tentera udara. Semasa saya melapuh diri dekat Tambun Ipoh untuk gerakan ke Pahang tentera udara di Pahang. Orang kata restu mak penting. Doa mak makbul. Sampai dekat Ipoh tiba-tiba saya uh, sakit. Ya, yeah, saya sudah naik apa ni dah dah ambil warren ya, eh, ambil warren daripada uh, Bukit Merah terus ke Ipoh untuk tentera udara. Saya aim saya cuma dua saja. Saya nak jadi tentera udara dan juga polis trafik. Dua sahaja. Kenapa? Sebab saya suka kerja yang mencabar. Saya tidak suka. Saya tidak ada niat langsung untuk bekerja di dalam ekon. Ya. Saya adalah anak pesawah. Tapi uh, bila bapa saya hantar saya ke Tambun untuk pergerakan ke Pahang, saya bersama sepupu saya, eh, perempuan dua-dua. Mak saya tak nak hantar saya. Dia tetap cakap saya mesti jadi misi. Tapi saya tetap nak pergi juga. Saya pergi. <laughs> Sampai dekat Ipoh, naik truck, turun, semua orang turun lompat. Saya turun tangga. Sebab <laughs> saya lembutlah masa itu sikit kan. Ada sikit wanita lah. Ya, berbanding dengan orang lain. Tapi saya sampai kat situ, saya sakit perut sangat-sangat. Lepas tu saya pergi hospital, tentera kat Tambun bawa saya. Saya tetap juga nak pergi. Bapa saya cakap balik. Saya cakap, saya nak pergi juga. Tapi bila pergerakan ke Pahang, saya tak boleh naik sebab saya sakit kan? Jadi saya balik. Saya balik, mak saya suka. <laughs> saya suka. Tapi saya protes. Saya tak nak pergi. Dua bulan kemudian, saya isi borang. Borang jururawat. Macam tadi, Maitren tu cakap, saya sign extreme, result saya bagus. Tapi, saya nak cerita-cerita yang macam adventure. Tapi, uh, bila saya isi borang, saya nak ambil jawatan paling rendah dalam kementerian. Saya fikir, dengan macam tu, mak saya mesti tak bagi saya jadi, betul tak? <laughs> saya minta penolong jururawat. Mula-mula saya nak minta tender tau. Saya tak tahu apa kerja tender, apa kerja pun jawab, saya tak tahu. Saya tahu jawatan paling rendah. Tapi saya dapat AN. Assistant nurse kan. Kemudian, uh, bila saya dapat AN, dia interview saya. Kenapa awak nak jadi misi? Sebab saya cakap mak saya suruh. Saya interview di KL. Uh, saya It's interview terus dapat. Terus dapat interview hmm. AN. Rupanya kerja misi sangat mencabar. Saya tak, tak, saya tak sangka basuh berak semua, betul tak? Cuci kencing semua, balik saya akan macam tak ikhlas sikit lah. Cuci-cuci berak kerja tu macam tak best lah. Macam tu kan? Lepas tu tiga tahun je, saya kerja tahun 1991. Saya bekerja umur saya 19 tahun. Ya, 1991. Kemudian saya uh, lepas tiga tahun, dulu tiga tahun baru sah jawatan kan? Lepas tu saya punya sister naikkan job staff nurse. Saya kerja staff nurse tujuh tahun saja. Saya punya matron naikkan pilot 1998 setahun setengah terus dapat diploma jurawat. Saya pergi. Saya pergi. Saya terus naik lagi staff nurse. Naik sister, naik. Tapi bila semakin lama naik, mak saya sakit, kakak saya, bapak saya sakit. Masa itu saya rasa pilihan mak saya tepat. Saya saya jaga mak saya. Period mak saya. 
najis mak saya saya takkan bagi orang lain sentuh saya yang jak cuci ya even modest dia pun saya cuci mak saya tangan kebas dua-dua uh-huh. saya tengok tapi adik saya melihat apa yang saya buat even adik saya SPM 1 SPM dia bagus STP straight lima prinsipal pun jadi jururawat Adik saya juga bagus pun jadi Kementerian Kesihatan. Bagi dia kerja tu macam bagus. Sekarang saya dah servis 27 tahun. Alhamdulillah. Mulai lepas sekarang ni saya sangat sayang pesakit. Even saya cuti pun saya mesti telefon ICU. Saya kerja kat ICU. Hmm. Pesen saya boleh hafal semua pesakit dekat ICU. Denosa dia. Ya. Yeah. Pasien tu mati pukul berapa pun saya tanya. Sudah pasien okey ke tak okey, okey tak okey. Ya, mak saya, mak mentua saya, bapa saya, ya. bapa saya pun saya jaga. Sampai satu hari husband saya cakap, saya nak exam tau masa saya ambil mid 2009. Orang lain jaga bapa saya, husband saya cakap, you jaga pasien beribu-ribu, kenapa satu bapa you tak boleh jaga? Husband saya cakap, kenapa bapa you satu-satu dalam dunia, you jaga pasien beribu-ribu. Tapi kenapa bapa saya tak boleh jaga? Sebab bapa saya, dia hypo 1.9 GM bulan puasa 2008 kat rumah, dah berbuih-buih semua. Saya ambil bapa saya dari Melaka ke Perak, bawa ke Melaka. Saya janji pada diri saya, saya akan jaga bapa saya sampai dia habis nyawa. InsyaAllah. Mak saya perelas Saya janji kalau orang lain boleh berdiri Kenapa saya tak boleh bagi mak saya berjalan Empat tahun mak saya perelas Berdiri berjalan Tiap-tiap pagi Saya pastikan mak saya makan yang cukup Saya bangun pukul empat pagi Siapkan mak saya makan Saya bagi, saya tukarkan Master bedroom bagi mak saya Biar saya biar nombor dua, nombor tiga Tapi sekarang mak saya dah tak ada Bapak saya dah tak ada Dah pergi untuk apa kita hidup dengan kemewahan kalau mak dan ayah kita tak ada? Mm-hmm. Okay, sister. So sekarang sebab tu saya Your sangat big suka applause kerja misi. Thank you for sharing. So, yeah. betapa pentingnya seorang jururawat yang wujud di dalam sesebuah keluarga. Are you proud to be a nurse? Tak dengar. Are you proud to be a nurse? Or only for the salary? No, isn't it? So, when the patient come to us as an impatient, it's a new patient coming. Mungkin yang pernah datang, yang pernah tak datang. Ada yang pernah datang regularly. Wajar atau tidak, seorang jurawat kata, oh, patient ni lagi. Grip dengan salam. Give a a big smile to the patient. Boleh cakap welcome? Selamat datang, cik. Boleh. But some patient, they don't like it. Tak ada orang nak masuk ward. Tapi kita greet dengan salam. Walaupun berapa kali dia masuk. Okay? So, bawa dia pada katil dan buat orientasi. Itu rutin, Betul? Senyumnya, senyumnya masih sama. Kita tengok kalau jururawat, ni, mostly of the patient coming, pagi, early morning, senyumnya bagaimana? Small, besar, sampai telinga. Cuba kita tengok dalam pukul 11 pagi. Hmm. Macam mana agak-agaknya matron kita punya nurse? Senyum lagi tak? Apa dia punya skor? Kita tengok dalam pain score. When you look at pain score. Pain score zero. Macam mana rupa? How do you like? Big smile. Itu dah makan nasi lemak lah tu. Pukul 11 pagi. Then we comes to? Why for? Why for? Why for? Ramai doktor round. 
Pain scale. Siapa pain dekat mana? Kalau nursing ni pain dekat mana? Sini. Banyak changes. Is it? Why? Why drop to four? Tengok pukul 12. Pukul 12 tengah hari apa jadi dekat pain scale? Lapan. Lajunya. Why? Lapan. Why so fast? Masya Allah. Report tak siap. Pukul satu tengah hari. Ini si pagi tau. Si pagi. Apa dia? Belum, pukul satu. Pukul satu nak balik? Belum. Azan Zohor keluar. Tadi lapan. Pukul dua belas, lapan. Drop to sembilan. Why? Banyak lagi tak settle. Tadi kita kata spiritual support. Semalam dengan hari ini cerita spiritual support. Greet the patient with salam. Give a big smile all the time. Kenapa boleh drop? Baru berapa jam? Yes, matron. Kenapa? Ha? Apa dia? Syaitan berbisik penat, dia kata. That's what we want. That's what we want. If you say no, why? Satu setengah I.O. tak tutup. Satu setengah O.T. panggil kes. Satu setengah, satu empat puluh. Masya Allah tak tahu apa jadi. Doktor buat rong. Eh, doktor buat tunil yang buat rong pun. Macam biasa dengar. Kan? Waktu ni klinik hantar pesen. Tak boleh hantar pukul dua. Kan? So, as a Muslim nurse, if you know this is our responsibility, you're working with soul. Tadi siapa jawab working dengan roh, soul? Tak boleh patah balik. Okay? This is the example that we are added in our SOP. Smile and salam. Smile and salam. Susah tak senyum? Kenapa saya tekan senyum sebelum yang lain-lain? Kecil tak senyum? Kecil ke besar? Besar. Ada yang cakap kecil? Kecil ke besar? Besar. Tiba-tiba jadi besar. Susah ke senang? Susah. Kalau tak, tak drop pukul 11 dah pin skor 4. Dia pin skor 4 apa? Macam ni ke? Macam ni. Dia macam ni je. Betul? The pin skor comes. Hmm. Ha, gitu. Right? Tambah-tambah kalau kawan tak nak tolong. This is not this is not the real situation. Kita belum pergi ED lagi, emergency department. Ada emergency department? Ada, put up your hands. So apa berlaku pada waktu pagi? Tudung dah sengit. Baru waktu pagi. You could imagine kalau kita rasa kita boleh bagi value yang terbaik as a Muslim nurse, senyum. Cukup. So, habis dah slide saya. Baik. So, bawa dia ke katil, give a good orientation to the patient. is a basic. So, macam mana nak bagi orientation? Usually in the hospital, we are always dah provide dah semua basic facilities. Ada hospital yang belum ada? Mostly dah ada. Okay? Dah ada ibadah facility, dah ada telekong. Sebab orang Melayu kalau tak ada telekong, ronda-renda, tak boleh solat. 
Kan? Tapi kita sediakan apa yang baik, apa yang terbaik. Semana cerita kita, we are the best ummah. We are the best nurse. Kita kena tanam dia jawab, we are the best. So kita kena bagi yang terbaik. Adakah tudung telekung Siti Khadijah yang the best untuk patient? Tak. Tapi keikhlasan yang kita bagi kepada pesakit, that's the best. Betul? <coughs> yang kedua adalah itqan dalam kerja. Bersungguh-sungguh dalam kerja. Dan yang terakhir kita tahu bahawa Allah sering melihat dalam keadaan apa sekalipun ihsan kepada kita. Okey. So dekat sini saya share lagi dalam new admission of course kita buat assessment according to holistic nursing assessment daripada physical, spiritual at the last term memang spiritual. Of course kalau patient datang fracture. Mental problem is sakit. Psychological suami tak datang, isteri tak datang. So all over body dia sakit. That's why pentingnya spiritual support. And then, penjagaan atau jagaan pesakit dari segi holistic, spiritual yang terakhir sekali. So, kita mesti faham apa yang pesakit perlu dalam penjagaan seharian dia. Seterusnya, so assessment. Apa nak buat kalau pesakit macam ni? One... Kalau pesen masuk, so kondisi dia begini. Kalau kita tidak tahu bagaimana kita nak membantu, itu dia kata tangkap muat. Kita tak nak. So kita nak jururawat kita tahu apa dia buat. Tahu bagaimana nak bantu. Dari orientasi, sampailah pesakit discharge daripada ward. So, this is the reason why some patient do not pray. Because tak ada orang nak remind dia. Nobody remind them what to do. Nobody tell them what to do. How? When? Okay? So, the example like patient with a colostomy bag. How often we change the colostomy bag? How often? Berapa kerap kita tukar? All the time, lima kali sehari kita tukar. Diapers, perlu kita tukar setiap masa. Kenapa tak? Ni revision je sebenarnya. Kalau patient continuously pas motion perlu tukar tak ada kerja lain nurse. Tu tadi kata tak sempat. Tu yang kata pukul 11 tadi dia tak senyum tu. Sebab kita merasakan bila kita implement ibadah friendly dalam sesuatu uh, prosedur kita rasa ia menyusahkan. Sebenarnya tidak. Dia ada ruksah. Sebenarnya dia ruksah kan? Dia ada ruksah dia. Ada kemudahan yang kita beri. Ini adalah contoh assessment form yang digunakan yang dimanakan di mana-mana hospital sama. But cuma kita edit dengan ibadah. Kalau kita lihat kalau di dalam assessment ni sama je. Almost is the same. Mungkin dia punya lain sedikit daripada mana hospital. But kita masukkan saja kiblat direction dalam orientasi. That's all. Kita mudahkan pesakit. Dan kita buat assessment dari segi solat dia. Dia boleh jalankan atau tidak dengan baik. Kalau perlu ada masalah, perlu rujukkan atau tidak. Kita rujuk kepada yang lebih arif. Mungkin ada ustaz atau ustazah. Dan kita sediakan fasiliti untuk memudahkan pesakit. Dan kadang-kadang nurse akan tanya, Pak Cik nak solat ke tak? Dia akan jawab apa? Nak ke tak nak? Pak cik nak solat ke? Encik nak solat ke? Nantilah. Lagi? Bila nurse pergi, dia akan cakap apa? Sakit pun kena solat ke? Tak payah keluar hadis kat dia. Ada nurse dia cukup jangan berlawan dengan patient. 
Tugas kita untuk pastikan, untuk remind dia sahaja. Okay? So, beritahu di sini kita sediakan. So, kita assess pada keadaan dia. Bagaimana kita nak assess dia? Clinical assessment tadi penting. Kalau kita tak assess dengan betul. Daripada awal assessment ni tadi, kalau kita tak assess dengan betul, contoh, patient datang dengan ankle sprain, fracture, patient datang dalam keadaan body ache, sakit badan, kita minta dia pergi ke bilik air, maknanya assessment kita salah. That's why kita kena assess dengan betul, baru kita akan tahu apa ibadah yang sesuai untuk dilaksanakan. Bagaimanakah solat ni dekat dalam ward? Okay? Dan penyediaan fasiliti yang memudahkan dia dalam ward. Ha, ni saya cakap tadi tu, basic ibadah fasiliti yang kita sediakan. Ha, memang dia akan berjalan selalunya, tak tahu dia pergi mana. Kita sediakan telekong 555 jalan, kita ganti balik. Berlaku tak? Berlaku. Kan? Ha, dia tak ada masalah sebab fasiliti kita boleh ganti tetapi ibadah yang kita maklumkan, kita beritahu, kita ajar yang itu akan kekal kepada dia. Okay? So nurses have to ensure that patient melaksanakan dengan terbaik. Okay? So kalau untuk nursing procedure, sama juga bagi salam, greet salam, explain and seek consent. Dapatkan consent daripada pesakit. Kalau perlu verbal consent, some situation is verbal consent. Contoh, injection. It's a verbal consent. Bagi tahu, saya nak bagi injection. This is a antibiotic injection. It's a verbal consent. Okay? So, ensure, then comments, bismillah. Itu membezakan kita dengan jururawat yang bukan Muslim. So, dalam prosedur, mewajibkan, kita baca bismillah, bismillahirrahmanirrahim, bagi injection. How happy they are. You're happy. Betul? So, kita doa. So, insya Allah ubat dah masuk. Alhamdulillah. So, insya Allah Allah akan bagi penyembuhan. Boleh? Sambil-sambil saja dalam prosedur. Okay? So, kalau dibenarkan, kalau ada, mungkin jantina yang sama untuk memberikan perawatan. Tapi kadang-kadang susah nak dapat. Betul, Matron? Kalau dalam muat, kadang-kadang lelaki ni tak tahulah jorok lelaki ni kat mana dia pergi. Gradnya ramai. Tapi dekat sektor hospitalnya tak ada. Mungkin ada satu dua yang kita boleh manfaatkan mereka. Okay? So dalam prosedur. So macam saya kata tadi, mulakan dengan yang selepas buat prosedur, bagi tahu dia, Alhamdulillah dan insya Allah. So remind pesakit, Uh, untuk melaksanakan ibadah dia dan doakan pesakit. Macam tadi, spiritual support yang diajak oleh Puan Rehan, uh, Miss Rehana, minta pesakit doakan kita. Okay? Pernah tak kita buat? Kalau kita tak pernah, ada satu yang baru yang kita boleh mulakan insya Allah. So yang sini sama juga, so waktu doktor datang uh, melawat pesakit, bagi salam, give a good smile, ensure patient is ready and comfortable condition. Proper attire covering aura. Okay, make sure the nurses pergi dulu. And then maintain privacy and dignity of patient. Um, of course, mahram or chapron is required when necessary. Okay, minimize exposure of the patient. Jangan simply nak buka bahagian yang tak tentu. Kalau nak check bahagian abdomen, abdomen sahaja. Ya, buka bahagian tertentu sahaja supaya dia menjaga aurat dan kita menjaga aurat dia. Okay? So yang seterusnya, for inpatient care juga, kalau di Al-Islam tu, this is a sharing aja. we are remind the patient on prayer time. Setiap waktu solat, the nurses will go to the patient and remind them. Zohor dah masuk, Encik. So, uh, asal dah masuk Encik, Encik boleh ke bilik air. Bagi pasien yang boleh berjalan. Bagi pesakit yang tak boleh berjalan, kita beri dia kemudahan. Mungkin kita bagi spray, peluh tayamum. So, kita bantu. Okay? Dan kita catat atau kita letakkan dalam file pesakit solat reminder. So, this patient already done. Already perform lah solat. So, kita tick kat situ shift by shift. Okay? 
So nurse tugas suju rawat ni hanya remind pesakit. Adakah perlu memaksa? Tak perlu. This is already added in our SOP. So monitor, siapa nak monitor? Leader of the ward. Head nurse, matron. So random check all the time. Adakah jururawat kita melaksanakannya? Okay. So inform religious officer jika ada untuk melawat pesakit. Melihat, we are called is hikmat ziarah untuk bantu. And also remind patient to remember Allah. Risat Al-Quran, zikir dan doa. And always remind and facilitate patient to perform their ibadah according to their condition. Itu yang assessment tadi. So penting the clinical assessment from the beginning. Alright, and documentation in spiritual assessment. It's the same with patient yang perlukan bantuan. Selalunya dalam report nursing, dia akan masukkan apakah keperluan dan perlu rujukkan atau tidak kepada ustaz dan ustazah. Uh, this one, during pass over report, feedback next to shift colleagues, dia dah tahu dah. Okay. Contohnya, pesakit ni perlu dibantu. Okay, next, next patient ni tadi saya dah Beritahu dia solat, tapi saya dah buat evaluation, dia masih tak solat zohor lagi. Nanti you pergi balik semula kepada pesakit. Okay? So kalau sekiranya tidak boleh, bolehkah kita paksa? Tak boleh. We just go, tapi jangan putus asa. Okay? We're not talking about solat semata-mata, tetapi dari segi akhlak jururawat juga kena jaga. Kita suruh pesakit solat, nurse-nya, Nurse-nya kena solat juga lah. Okay. Bersungguh-sungguh jururawatnya membantu pesakit. Nurse-nya tak apalah ajak lagi. Tak apalah. Nanti dia dekat-dekat nak asal baru dia solat. Tak boleh gitu. Okay. So this one, kalau dekat ICU, bantulah pesakit. Assess ke dalam pesakit. Kalau patient on ventilator, perlu ke kita bangunkan dia? Okay. Tak perlu. Wudukkan dia. Dan solatlah mengikut keadaan yang semalam dah belajar ibadah pesakit. Saya rasa gambaran jelas untuk basic membantu pesakit. So remind and assist the patient to perform wuduk tayamum or solat jamak. And remind and encourage patient also relative to risat Al-Quran, zikir dan doa. Ha, kalau di Al-Islam itu memang kita sediakan electronic devices MP3, kita letakkan kat telinga dia so dia akan sentiasa mendengar bacaan Al-Quran. Mudah sahaja. Dan daripada relatif datang, apa dia buat? Dia buat apa? Uh, mak ayah saya dekat dekat ICU lagi. Post. Biasa uh, kan? Uh, adik saya masih kritikal. Post. Adakah sesuai? Tak sesuai. Jadi kita kena remind them. This is that Da, apa yang dia boleh membantu dia just remind sahaja eh, kalau di sana di di al-islam itu memang kita tak pernah kadang apa juga bentuk bentuk penggambaran dalam hospital then of course ada hospital juga yang sama okay in maternity ward remind and help patient to perform solat jamak before labor okay doa and zikir all the time aurat and privacy dan kita bagi dia maternity attire di sana kita sediakan Seluar bersalin ya? so, Tidak dibenarkan sama sekali Social media dan juga Muslim lady doctors and nurses Kita memang ada uh, Muslim ladies doctors Okay, so untuk uh, Husband We are allowed husband Accompany wife Dalam bilik bersalin Kalau tak nak masuk pun kita tolak dia masuk Wajib Kenapa rasa-rasa Semua support lagi responsibility of course dia punya responsible dia kena responsible okay lagi why pardon more support yes lagi lagi sakit tak kurang Sakit, sakit. Contraction is contraction. Kenapa rasa-rasa? Sekarang di di di, di government pun dia husband friendly, is it? 
Kenapa rasa rasa kita nak husband kita dengan kita? Dia tak rasa. Kenapa rasa rasa? Insaf kejamnya. Kenapa? Hmm. Lebih menghargai, of course. Lagi? Berapa ramai kat sini memang nak husband masuk labor room? Angkat tangan. Apa dia? Nak mak? Alai. Boleh terus azankan. Dengar tu bahaya pahala lelaki semua. Okey? Kalau tak nak masuk, anak nombor 6 ke 7 ke 8 ke kita suruh masuk. Sudah menjadi adat, anak nombor 1 nurse kena marah. Semua nurse tak kena. Mengangguk sister. Tapi nombor 6 jadi pada saya, bukan saya lah. My experience cakap, tak apa nurse, biarlah biar. Sebelum tu, history of memang kena marah saja. Sebab tak kena jururawat buat tu tak kena. Tapi bila ada nombor-nombor ni tak apa, biar dia je. Tapi di sini kita beritahu, bukan kita cerita tentang tanggungjawab dia. Doa seorang suami itu penting untuk seorang isi di bilik bersalin. Dan kita tak benarkan dia ambil sebarang penggambaran dan kita nak dia baca doa. Kalau dia ada Islam tu dia ada satu doa, dia letak memang untuk suami dia baca. Di dalam bilik bersalin. Dia ada menghadap suami, suami duduk dia menghadap situ. Baca lah. Eh? Okay. So, we assist, uh, so, assist the guardian and newborn while giving azan dan ikhamah. Ni saya rasa semua hospital pun dah buat benda yang sama. For the dialysis patient. Okay. For the dialysis patient, always comment bismillah sebelum kita nak kita nak start procedure. Remind and assist patient to perform wuduk and solah. So, selalunya patient yang dialysis ni dia akan solat duduk saja. Eh? So uh, doa dan zikir, Islamic audio, visual and program. And usually every Saturday we are allow our religious officer together with this patient for tazkirah. Alright? So for pre-operative care, we are cover patient with aura. I remind patient to recite Al-Quran, zikir, doa before operation. So we encourage them. Berapa ramai yang berani masuk dewan bedah? Bukan hari-hari masuk dewan bedah. Scrub nurse masuk hari-hari. Tapi patient tidak. Berapa dia risau dan takut. Okay. So selalunya our religious officer will coming every morning or before patient entering the operation theater. The mask is a compulsory. Okay. So for the prolonged case or prolonged procedure, we remind patient for solat jamaah and remind patient to remember Allah all the time and before giving uh, anesthesia. Okay, so in the after operative, uh, post operative, we remind and assist the patient in performing solah according to their condition. So after op, usually they are still tak sedar, bukan? So that's why pentingnya solat jamak sebelum pergi operation. So selepas itu, sekiranya pesakit telah sedar, tahap kesedaran dia dia dah mampu melakukan solat, dia boleh menjamakkan atau melakukan solat pada waktu yang telah masuk waktu solat. Okay, encourage patient to recite Quran, zikir and doa. For the terminal ill patient, we remind patient to remember Allah all the time, assist patient to perform solat, sama juga assess keadaan dia, sekiranya dia mampu untuk menggerakkan mata sahaja, then we encourage dan beritahu. Eh? So, recite Al-Quran by family, Uh, inform religious officer to visit patient and family members uh, count for a counseling for a counsel of family members okay for the last death and dying patient counsel family members regarding the possible outcome and of life salunya what the doctors do this is this patient is dnr okay? after this there is no active resource so kita nak family members dia ada bersama encourage member um, family Bersama-sama dengan dia untuk recite, whisper kalimah syahadah. And uh, if no family member, siapa yang perlu buat? Nurse. Okay. 
So recite a Quran, family members or use electronic devices and install, uh, inform religious officer to visit patient and family members. This is what we are routine to in Al-Islam. Okay, patient death. Of course, we assist and provide the privacy to the family, managing last office and arrange body to move home from the hospital. Because in Al-Islam, kami tak ada mortuary. We don't have a mortuary. We cannot keep a patient. But the good cooperation with the uh, Kampung Baru Mos. Uh, okay? So at the end, my conclusion is we hope to share this nursing practice with other uh, as part our responsibility as a Muslim nurse to give our best services and achieve madratillah, inshallah. So, I hope there is no question because this is sharing only. So, um, we have start up with ourselves. As I said, from the beginning, smile is the most important. So, kalau kita rasa kita mungkin dalam keadaan kita tidak stabil, kita tidak mampu memberi yang terbaik, Mungkin kita boleh bagi yang baik. Tapi kita tahu, we are the good Muslim. We earn for jannah, insyaAllah. We get madatillah from Allah. Okay? Thank you for all. Wabillahi taufiq wa hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My apologies to you. I said goodbye to you in the last session. I'm probably still a bit jet lagged. And I completely forgot and didn't realize that I had one more session after lunch. But alhamdulillah, really glad that, um, really glad that we ha uh, have got this session because actually I think you're probably going to enjoy it very much, inshallah. You know, yesterday I asked for three volunteers. MashaAllah. Allah made it so easy. Those volunteers came just like that. A dua answered. Alhamdulillah. So, MashaAllah, I've got three lovely sisters that are going to help me. Oh, yeah, the brothers never volunteered. Didn't think about that. Yeah. Is that because you thought I didn't include you? Anyway, never mind. It would have been good because even this morning, the patients were all female, weren't they? Well, if we get time, a little chance at the end, maybe we will ask one of the brothers to come and role play with us. All right. So first, that was my apologies for making my mistake and thinking that I'd finished uh, for today. But no, alhamdulillah, here we are. I would like, inshallah ta'ala, before we start with the role plays, to just very, very quickly just give you a glimpse of the slides um, to do with what you've more or less covered today, all right? If I had more time, I'd love to be able to really talk about it a little bit more with you. But otherwise, just let's have a quick look. It's been more of a recap than anything else. I'm pressing. I've pressed a lot. Does it want to play? Oh, it's gone blank. Oh, you have to turn it on. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Spiritual care. So, we looked, we had an exercise, we looked at what spir spiritual, spirituality was. And here, are a few definitions for anybody who really wants to be able to make any notes or if they're really interested in looking at that. And that, there are different definitions. I gave you a few yesterday. I've mentioned one or two today. And here, there's again another one. And each one, as you look, it's about expression, about being a person. It's about inner meaning in experiences. And it's about dynamic relationships with others. It's about the self or the soul and whatever the person values. Spiritual needs may be attained either through faith, remember? It doesn't have to be religion. 
It doesn't have to be with a religion, it can be. But otherwise, it could be to do with hope, love, trust, meaning, purpose, relationship, forgiveness, creativity, and experiences. And this, I thought, felt was really important for yourselves, particularly. So, nurses, doctors, other staff can adopt roles as comforters. That's a nice word, isn't it? Comforters. So you're doing the work that you're doing, but you're giving spiritual comfort. You're comforting them. So it's the way you talk to them. It's the way you engage with them. It's the way that you do what you're doing with them, which shows dignity and care and compassion. And this is all spiritual. So when you do that, you're enabling them with their spiritual needs. Researchers investigating spirituality and chronic illness have found spirituality to be a powerful resource for coping with health-related problems. So, do you know what? The next time you say something kind when you're doing your intervention with your patient, remember that actually you're giving them something much, much more. You're giving them that special care, that special attention, that special compassion that is spiritual. And you're bringing them back, inshallah ta'ala, to the way that Allah wants us to be. It's your duty. It's the duty of everyone. Uh, Allah watches us all in what we're doing, and we should feel this. Sitting with the broken down until they are broken open and the spirit can be at work. I think you saw some of that today. A way of being that enables the individual to make sense of the present moment. You might only be doing something that's going to take 30 seconds or you might be doing a procedure that's going to take you five minutes. You might just be taking their, you know, uh, taking um, uh, their blood pressure. But it's the way you do it, and the words you say, and how you do it that can be spiritual. So it can either be spiritual or it can be not spiritual at all. The choice is yours. But to make it spiritual, be beneficial for them and for you. Yeah. Um, identify possible spiritual resources that sustain and then lead to the integration of body, mind, and spirit. So if you have access for them to have some, some time to sit with someone, then you should try to um, mention those resources. Enabling the individual to reach the place of wholeness. Now, we never mentioned that, but we talked about holistic care. Yeah, did we? Yeah, but wholeness is about feeling complete. Experiences of spirituality. Look, what's that say? Read it out for me, anybody, everybody. Yeah, looking at the sunset. It's an, it's an experience of spirituality. Louder? Well, this is obviously by a non-Muslim. But they're all, well, I can't say obviously about non muslim they're all things which are really important in terms of spirituality. Now, why did that go up there? <laughs> right. Disempowerment. That's when somebody comes into hospital. <laughs> 
<laughs> Can somebody move this? <laughs> right. I'm obviously not very clever with my IT skills. <laughs> or I would play about with things and think, oh, that's nice, but it didn't quite work. But anyway, this is when the, uh, a patient can feel disempowered. But empowerment, one patient said, and she was 90, she, I think it was a she, was 96 year old and seven months. She said, when I talk, I feel my existence. This existence, this feeling, is all about spirituality. And that's it. Oh, it's not quite. Empower your patients by helping to meet their spiritual needs. So when you talk to them, when you say something, you make them feel alive. You can make their day good, or you can make their day really rubbish by just one or two sentences or a smile. Listen to what they are saying. Listen to the silences. Don't have time to talk about silences, but silences are important. Help them feel their existence. And that's empowering them. Let them know that you care about them. Oops. Let them know that you care about them as people, not as bed numbers and symptoms. It's so easy just to make them feel like an item. Yeah? And, da da! <laughs> Didn't work, did it? <laughs> da da! Thank you. I didn't want you to miss that. And it was important that you had some of that really um, to bring it all together. Okay. So what we're going to do now, mashallah, here's the fun bit. The fun, I usually love it when people offer to come. Um, right, these two are just to be left down the side. And one over there, and one. those two are fine there, and this can be here. Oh, thank you so much. What lovely brothers coming to my rescue and my aid. Jazakumullah khair. So, what we're going to look at are scenarios. If we had a whole afternoon, which we don't have, um, I would have let you choose the scenario, and I would have let you said, right, I'd like to see a role play about a patient who is and you could have chosen. But I think, really, because I've been having lots of conversations with lots of different people here, you've already given me some ideas, and I'd like to bring them um, forward in this role play. So this is how it's gonna happen, so listen carefully. The role play, I've got three for you ready. If there's time, we'll have a fourth one. The role play will be that I'm gonna be the chaplain in all three role plays. Um, this session is on, what's it on? Do's and don'ts, thank you. All right? And what's going to happen is that in the first role play, we will give you the scenario, and then we're going to play it, and you'll watch. When we finish the role play, which will probably be about three minutes, when we finish the role play, then I will then ask the person playing the role play with me how she felt. And you'll listen to her. And when she expresses what she felt, then we're opening it up to discussion. And I'm going to ask you yet again about what you thought about it. Any do's and don'ts in it or or anything at all, okay? And then we'll move on to the second and the third. So, if I might ask my first person who's going to play, uh, please, uh, this is our lovely sister Gwen, who has very kindly offered to be a dying patient. We thought this would be a good role play, especially being in a place where, you know, it's a, a critical, area of cancer and uh, di we have dying patients. So, we need, well, oh, we should have made you a bed actually. <laughs> ah, right, so, 
The chair will not do. She is dying. Right. Are you happy, Gwen, to put your feet up? Right. I will make it easy by putting one chair there as well, and then I'll get you another one to make a bed. <laughs> oh, we haven't done this very well. We should have got some props. A blanket would have been ideal, wouldn't it? Actually, you just don't, you don't need both, do you? No, yes, you do. Oh, anyway. Are you reclined enough? Because you're dying, actually. <laughs> it's nice to have fun and it's nice to laugh, but there will be some serious bits in it, okay? And that is important as well. Yeah. Um, right. I'm going to have to ask you to get up again because I need the audience all to be able to see me talking to you and I'm not going to sit at your feet. Okay. So if I can put you there instead, now you can, now you can sit down where you were and put your feet up. Ah, I bet you don't get anybody at home to do this for you, do you? <laughs> and um, can I turn this around that way and make it more like a real bed? That'd be fantastic and it won't be in the way. That's brilliant. And there's the chair. Leave that there. You got any questions about this patient? No? Do you want to choose some symptoms or do you want to choose anything? She's dying, that's all we know right now. Is that enough for you? Oh, okay. Right, here goes, inshallah. I don't need to do the introduction bit. You've seen me do it earlier on today, all right? We'll miss that out because we want to get into the nitty gritty of it all, all right? So actually, I'm just going to sort of like get straight into there and uh, come, up, come over and see her. And perhaps because she is dying, maybe I have seen her before as well. Does it matter? We'll just go with the flow. Okay. Oh, what, what's her name? What, what would you like to call her? We're not, her real name is Gwen. We're not going to call her Gwen. What would you like to call her? Aisha. Aisha it is. Oh, okay. Asalaamu As Alaikum Aisha. Oh. How's today? <sighs> Today's been really difficult. Actually, I, I can't even look at my parents mm. just because they've never, I don't think they ever thought they'd see their daughter die before them. Mm. And I think that's... It just, I, I don't even know how, I can't even look at my dad. I don't even, I just, <sighs> and I think they don't know how to, what, know what to say to me either. It's just, that's what makes it so difficult because I think they had so many hopes for me and I just, I just don't know why Allah's put me through this. I, I just feel so, I just don't understand. Mm. Oh, it's hard, isn't it? And we don't understand why God does what he does. And I, th and I did just speak to the nurse looking after you today. And she was saying that you've taken a turn for the worst. Is that right? And that you wanted to talk about how hard it is to these last times to... I just feel like I haven't been a good Muslim. I haven't done... I haven't been praying, I, I haven't been fasting, mm -hmm. I don't, I haven't been practicing, and I just feel so far away from Allah right now, and that's what's really, yeah. I regret. With Allah, there is never, never any despair in His mercy. Allah tells us in the Quran quite clearly, do not despair of the mercy of your Lord. And he even, Aisha, he even goes on to say that those who despair of his mercy, it is like the unbelieving folk, like kuffar. So Aisha, you're not even allowed to believe that Allah is not going to be merciful on you. It doesn't matter what you've done wrong or what you haven't done. You have a regret in your heart. Allah knows it. But I'm scared to die. Yeah. 
I'm scared to die. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me one second. Sure. Sorry. This is going to put me off, so I, I just can't be having this. Mm. I can't turn the thing off. Oh, it's done. Oh, thanks. It's cold. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my body and my, my soul? My shirt. We don't know about any of it, but what we do know is that Allah only wants you to come back to him. We don't know of anybody's future. I don't know mine. Nobody knows theirs. What we do know is that Allah says that his mercy is greater than his anger. We all are sinners. We all make mistakes. We all do wrong. We were never created angels who are pure. It is often through our wrongdoing that makes us turn back to him, that makes our hearts want to come close to him. Can you talk to my parents for me? I can't, I can't talk to them. I can't, I can't look at them, and, and I just of course I don't know what to say. Of course I will. Of course I will. Thank you. But what's really important is for you to know, to make your amends with God, with Allah, to make your amends and to know and to trust that he created you and he knows how difficult anything has been for you and that right now he knows what's in your heart. So you make sure that you say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. You make sure that you remember that creed with which we are who we are in our belief and believe and do what you can. If you are so ill and you're not able to do your prayers, and we did talk last, last time I came to see you, we did talk about when you're able to, how there are concessions in Islam and you can lie praying, etc. But if you can't manage what you can't manage, it really doesn't matter because Allah knows that. Aisha, Allah loves you, he created you. Allah's love is unbounded. He loves us more than a mother loves her child. Which mother wouldn't forgive her child? Hmm? So you don't worry about anything because this world is only but a blink of the eye. The Prophet wasallam said this. It's just a blink of the eye. We, we came here just as strangers as, 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 as travelers. Our destiny is not the dunya. Our destiny is not the earth. Our destiny is the hereafter, where we will all go and we will be together again. So when you fear death, it's good. You fear death because you fear to do wrong by Allah. But he is merciful. Mm -hmm. Remember him in your heart. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you, Gwen. You. That was lovely. You were a very good dying patient. <laughs> Gwen, how did that make you feel? I know you don't know what it feels like yeah. to be dying. Well, I hope you don't. Um, but how did you feel about somebody being with you at this time? I felt like it was very reassuring because um, just what you were saying, it was just, it just made a lot of sense, and it just felt like you cared. Like yeah. you were saying, because you cared. Yeah. yeah. It yeah. was sincere. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. Uh -huh. You're welcome. And now over to everybody. You can uh, take your seat and join us in the discussion, inshallah. Over to everybody now. Comments, please. What comments do you have? They can be questions if you want, or they can be just comments. Um, so, you, thank you, Gwen. Um, I think you, you, you said something along the lines that you are not allowed to even think that Allah is not of mercy. You're not allowed what? 
to, to think, even think that yes. oh, it's not a mercy. And yeah. there was also a lot of emphasis. Not to despair of his yeah. mercy. Yeah. And then there was not. Um, so there was an emphasis on how you know Allah is closer to you, um, and then our wrongdoings makes us closer to God. So the, those can bring the words, us closer. Yeah, bring to us God. closer to God. Yeah. Sorry. yeah. Um, I was just wondering: is there is the reason that you had an emphasis on that? Is it because she started off saying that she was she felt that she was getting further yes. to God? Yes. But you would not say that. Like you wouldn't have that much emphasis if she didn't start it off. With Absolutely. That. Like I said earlier on, patient led. Our interventions. So this is chaplaincy intervention. So if you do ever have chaplaincy or a uh, religious officer or a whoever in your trust uh, in your hospital, eventually in short life you don't already have that. But if you have that, you will this th and you refer this patient to a chaplain, then the chaplain would come and do this. Okay, this is not just spiritual care. It is spiritual care, but it's religious care as well in this case, all right? In all the cases that we're going to be looking at. But whatever the case, it is, is patient-led. So where the patient wants to go in that conversation is where I will go with them, right? Yes, so the answer is yes. Just to add on, I think the way that you put it was nicely done, mm -hmm. um, the, way, the words that you say, because mm -hmm. I guess one of the things that most common for our practice is that when they do say, you know, I'm not closer to God or I feel distance, and, like, and they will say, you can't think that way or macam tak boleh fikir macam tu. You know, like the, the Malay words, that's like, you cannot, you cannot think that way. You know, that's wrong. Right. You know? So I think like the first um, response that you give um, paves the pathway to that discussion. If you start off with saying, you can't think that way. Then You're building you know. the barriers. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. Any more comments? Are you getting sleepy and tired? Have you had a lot of lunch to eat? Can we all just stand up for 10 seconds? Okay, can we stand up for 10 seconds? And let's see if you can get up in one second. Lovely. A little stretch, a little move. Don't hit the person next to you. Lovely. Alhamdulillah. Remember why you're here. Remember why you've come. Remember you want to take as much as you can take back with you from whatever you get here. Okay? Inshallah. Is that a bit better? Are you a bit supple? That's nice. Now you are permitted to sit down if you are not going to go to sleep. Bismillah, sit down. Any other comments about a dying patient? What are your experiences of dying patients? Was that good practice? Was it good practice, yes or no? What was good about it? Sorry? Lessen their fear. Oh, precisely. Exactly. Yeah. So give me one do and one don't. What's the do? Patient led, okay. Give me another do. Come on! What else should you be doing? What is good about it? Give hope, brilliant. Somebody's about to leave the world. They're about to go. You can make them, help them to have a good death. By the way, if you Google good death, there's a Muslim who's written something really good on that. I didn't mean to say good on that, but anyway. But you, uh, you can find an, a really good article. But it's about letting somebody go in, in, in a good way. Right, okay. Yes. Ah. Uh, did you hear that? No. She honored my request because I asked her to talk to my parents, and that was very helpful that she was willing to do that for me. Yeah. 
That's good. Like a dying person's request, last request. So can you see everything really is about what the patient wants? It's not what I think they should have. It's what they want. It's not like, ah, oh, so let me give you one of the don'ts. It's not like, ah, oh, no, 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 no. You have been given, the doctors have said whatever, and you, we're not, you're not going to be uh, living for very long, and you really need to make sure now that you have um, uh, paid off your debts, that you've arranged that the debts are going to be paid, that um, you um, have spoken to all the family about the things that you need to speak to them about, and that you say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah before you die, because you need to be able to do that before you die. No spirit in that, is there? Well, not a good one, anyway. Okay, shall we have number two? Should we do number two now? Okay, let's have the second one. So this one, um, this, this is our lovely sister, uh, Aida. Who, and what name would you like to give her? She ain't got a name. Give me a name. Fatima. Okay. So Fatima is, I've forgotten what you're doing now. You are the, sorry? Yeah. Uh, Oh, right, okay. Is this the one about the punishment? I forgot, I forgot what I'm doing. <laughs> Sorry, one second, let me just get my notes. Here we are, here we are. Ah, uh, yes, it's that one, isn't it? Yes. Lovely. Cool? Fantastic. So I am coming to see um, Fatima. So Fatima, you can have a book to read while you're sitting, or you can be playing with the phone, as most young people do. And she's sitting there, and I'm going to come and see her. She's only 18 years old, um, but she's been in hospital. Oh, she needs this as well. Thank you. Okay. And I haven't met her before, all right? But I just know that um, she's a patient and, um, and it's something serious and I don't know what it is, but I'm coming in just to, have, just to see her, inshallah. Asalaamu Alaikum. My name is Rehana and I work at the hospital here. I'm a chaplain and I've just come over to see you and spend a couple of minutes with you if, you, if you'd like me to, uh, give you a smile. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, okay. All right, can I take a chair and sit by you? Sure. Thank you. Oh. Watching anything nice? Just sketching up on things. Ah. Okay. How have you been? I'm all right. It's good. Looking forward to going home? Yeah, I guess so. There's no place like home, is there? Yeah. Yeah. That's good. We're not medi medics, so I have no idea why you're here or anything, but just want you to know that everything we share is confidential. If you do feel you want to share anything, but that's what, that, what we're here for. We've got that time to be able to give you. Yeah. yeah. So you're not the doctors, are you? No, no. I'm a chaplain, and that means somebody who's not a medic at all. I might know a little bit about what goes on in medicine, but I'm not a medic. I'm here to give you a confidential space. Um, it's confidential in that anything you share won't be shared anywhere else unless it was something that was going to be harmful to you or to others, in which case I wouldn't be able to keep it confident. Oh, that's funny that you see that. Oh, really? Yeah. I came in because I started cutting myself. Mm. You've been self-harming for a while? Yeah. So when you said going back home, mm. I don't know about that because my parents brought me here. Mm. I'm not that happy about it. You don't want to be here. Yeah. No. And they keep on saying, you know, you've got to go back to God. And if you're going to do that here right now, I don't know. Yeah, but going back to God is a solution, isn't it? A 
That's what you say, and that's what my parents say. But you don't feel that. Not at all. Don't you know that God loves you? Does he? He loves everybody. Mm. You've just got to turn to God and, you know, he will, he will, he'll forgive you. He will take you, you know, and he'll make things right for you. So he's seeing that he's punishing me for what I'm doing right now. Is that what you're trying to say? I'm not saying he's punishing you, but I'm just saying that that's where you're going to find peace, really. If you, you know, we all do things wrong. But if you were to, to call on him, you know, you'd probably find peace in yourself as well. If you start praying and you do the things that you want and call to him. I believed in him once and did not work. Believed him. I tried. I'm still feeling hopeless. I hate myself. So I cut. And you are saying that I need to believe in him? Are you forcing me to do something? You can't force me well, to I'm do not something. Trying, I'm not forcing you to believe, but I'm just saying you know, that you should try it. You should just, just try it. How long is this going to take? Okay. Right, I'm going to stop it right there, okay? <laughs> Don't go away. Don't go away. So, Aisha's a bit of a difficult one. <laughs> But she's a real one. And there's lots of Aisha's like that about. And they've got a lot of baggage. They've got a lot to, to share. I'm not going to ask Aisha just right now how she felt. Because I think she's already expressed it. Yeah? But I'm going to ask you now for your comments, please. Please shout them out or... Put your hand up for the mic. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, I heard that she cannot accept her illness. Mm -hmm. She's a stubborn patient. <laughs> Cannot um, hear what your in uh, I mean your comment. Your <laughs> that's all. Okay. Thank you, thank you. More comments, please. Let's hear quite a few before we have a discussion. Over here, please. Assalamualaikum. Uh, she has a lot of anger. She has a lot of anger and and I I I, I don't know how if I would you I don't know how to deal with her <laughs> anger and stubbornness. <laughs> okay. Yeah, fine. Any more comments? Huh? Improve. I'm very rude. <laughs> Any more comments? Come on, what did you think? What were you thinking when we were talking? Tell me. Yeah? She wasn't happy to see me, was she? No. What else? Ah, she's in denial. Yep. What else? I try to keep... I didn't hear. Steady, steady. I try to keep her steady. I, oh. You, you Myself or her? You. Oh, I try to keep myself controlled. Ooh, okay. Okay. <laughs> this is so cool. <laughs> I'm enjoying this. So more comments, please. Yeah. She doesn't believe God loves her. That's right. She made that pretty clear, didn't she? Yep. Anything else? She's blaming. Yeah. Yeah. Everything else in the world is wrong. She's okay, actually. Everything else is wrong. Any, any last one or two comments? <laughs> yeah. 
I need to, f to find another method. Okay, good. That's a good, uh, uh, a good observation. Now, can I just turn your minds to think about the chaplain a bit more, please? You gave me one. You said she was, the chaplain was trying to stay calm, calm down and st yeah. Okay. What else about the chaplain? What we have seen is just an example of how patience is needed when you are in cha chaplaincy because I think she's a reflection of many other cases mm. in the recent time that we have to deal with, especially that nowadays we have lots of millennials. So yeah. have, they, have, they have different way of dealing with things. Yeah. So the more that it challenges us when we are to go into chaplaincy, and it will test our endurance on how to deal with them properly. Otherwise, if we are not going to deal with them properly, we might be losing them. Yeah. So what is your opinion on the chaplain then? So uh, chaplaincy... On this need, chaplain, this chaplain <laughs> that just saw in Aisha. Your, in that case, more patience is needed. The you chaplain be, needs to be more patient. Yeah, and you should be more, I think, although it entails a lot of therapeutic communication, you have to uh, be very careful and it really is a challenging one. So yes. I think we have to ready with that instance. Allah bless you for saying the right things. Remember, this is a do's and don'ts. I want honest hands up, honest hands up. You're all honest, of course you are. Put your hands up if you didn't see a fault in the chaplain. Other way around. Put your hands up if you saw fault in the chaplain. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, you're changing your mind now. Not many of you. So everybody else thought, actually, she did a good job. Nah, she was a bad chaplain. She started off pretty good because her training was quite good at the beginning, you see. So she knew how to approach and she knew how to be nice. But actually, I'd like you to watch how it should be done. Okay? You ready, Aisha? Oh! <laughs> oh, yeah, Aisha's probably died by now. How the balance is done? Assalamu alaikum. Sorry to disturb what you're doing. Um, I'm just doing my rounds. I'm Rihanna. I'm uh, one of the chaplains here, and I just thought I'd come and spend a few moments with you, and if you wanted me to just sit with you for a bit. Yeah, I guess so. Okay. Am I okay to sit here? Yeah. Uh, are you watching anything, looking at anything nice on? on no, just checking up on things. Oh, okay. Mm. Something to do while you're in hospital as well, I suppose. It's yeah, I guess so. Yeah. It's hard for you? It's pretty tough. It's so mm -hmm. boring here. Nothing mm -hmm. much to do, really. Mm -hmm. Is there? You're hoping to go home soon. No place like home. Yeah, you guys can say that. Mm -hmm. Where else can I go? Yeah. Oh. I can see that it's really tough for you, isn't it? I'm sorry to see that. I'm sorry to hear that from you. I hope it starts to get better for you. Yeah. Uh, I hope so too. Just want you to know, Fatima, that um, anything you might want to share with me is completely confidential, unless it's something which is about harming yourself or harming others. And then I can't keep it t quiet. But I'm here otherwise to hear you and listen to you. Mm, it's funny that you say that. Mm -hmm. I've been self-cutting myself. That's why oh. I'm here. That's why my parents sent me here. Oh. oh, 
I'm so sorry. Yeah. Life must be really, really painful. It is. Yeah. But it nobody must... seems to care. Oh. Nobody. Fatima, go back to God. Return to God. Pray. Yeah. So what everybody's saying to you? And are you going to be that person who's going to say that? I'm not here to tell you to do anything, Fatima. I'm just here to listen to you and to be next to you and to be with you. And if you want to be to pray with you, but I'm here just to be able to hear you, hear you and let you say what you feel you want to be able to say and know that you can say it safely. It's tough when people don't listen to me. It's tough. Yeah. I wish they did. My parents are not listening to me. Yeah. Does it feel like everybody's too busy for you? Yeah. They're not listening. They say they're there, mm. but they're not listening. Have they asked you to go for counselling? <sighs> yeah, but I don't want to. They'll be just mm. going to tell me what to do. They all tell me what to do. They're not mm -hmm. listening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, I, if I might say, uh, Fatima, um, in my experience, there are very many different counsellors um, who work using different types of counselling, different models of counselling. So one model of counselling doesn't always work for one person, but another model of counselling can work for another person. So I really, I really understand how you feel that you probably don't have any trust in it. It might be something to consider. Uh, try one, and if they use a certain model of counselling that you don't like, then try another. So there's different things, like there's something that we called person-centred counselling, and that's about really listening to what you've got to say. Basically, all of your counselling will be about listening to what you've got to say. It won't be about advice giving. And they will just facilitate your thoughts and mirror things for you so that you can start to see what you're feeling and saying. Then there's other types of counselling like CBT, and I can tell you a bit more about the others as well. I just want to tell you that there are different kinds, and it might be something that you might want to try, especially if you're already feeling that you're not managing to communicate with you, that you, you know, mum and dad are not really managing to com communicate that well mm -hmm. at the moment, um, and that there isn't anybody, then it might just be a good thing. Is there one here? In the um, hospital? I can I can ask for you. I don't know the answer to that, but I can ask for you, and I'll find out. Would you like Would you like me to ask? I guess so. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Fatima, how did you feel in scenario one and scenario two? Okay. Scenario one. I didn't want her to be there because yeah. you know, like it was. I felt like I was, I was busy on my phone and then someone just coming in and then trying to talk to me. So, and then it later created this sense of anger because mm. she's like any other person in my life, yes. telling me what to do, telling me that this is the right thing to do and you should be doing this and you should pray and you should you know, um, believe in God and I'm stubborn and rude. You know, so that. <laughs> but then the second, um, second situation, there was no force. She wasn't imposing anything. She was giving suggestions, allowing me the opportunity to tell, you know, what I was going through. Make a choice. And make a choice of, you know, this, this could be a next step. So opening a door rather than shutting mm. one. Yeah. So. yeah. Thank you, Ida. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> comments. Just two comments, that's all I'll have. Any comments at all from anybody? Was it different from the first one? I mean, was the second? So you saw the chaplain being, doing the things that she should be doing, or he should be doing. The first one, I tried to cleverly disguise it by being nice, because often people come and they are quite nice. But then we sometimes go wrong because we feel We've got an agenda of our own. We need to make this person religious. We need to save her from the hellfire. We need to make sure that she does the right thing by praying and turning to God. 
and we think that this is going to be the best way. Well, yeah, we do think that. But the methods, did you see the two methods? The second one had a positive impact. She might even start praying afterwards because it wasn't being pushed on her. Yeah, should we finish that one now? Let's go for the third then. Right, we welcome um, Gatnareini, who is a friend from mine from many, many years ago back in England. And um, she is going to, and I'm not going to guess it this time, I'll just look at my notes instead. Ah, she's not going to be a patient. She is a member of staff. Because as we said earlier on to you, that the chaplaincy, chaplaincy is not just for patients. Chaplaincy is for families. And chaplaincy is also for staff. Okay? So, what's happened is that um, Noreni has already called me. And, um, sorry, not going to be Noreni. Can you give uh, this member of staff a, n a name, please? Sarah. Okay. So, Sarah has, has called me already to say, can I make an appointment with you, please? Um, um, I've got 20 minutes in my lunch break, and I really could do with a sit-down chat with, um, uh, with yourself, please. Now, you haven't got 20 minutes for me to sit here and do this, and I haven't got 20 minutes, so, but that's what we did. And we're going to give you a snippet, a few minutes or so, out of the 20 minutes that she's made an appointment for. Okay. So, here we go. I've already met her. I already know her in the wards or whatever, but she's making an appointment. We've seen each other. Okay. Uh, uh, Asalaamu As Alaikum. I'm so, so sorry I've been a bit rushed, but uh, glad that you've um, come, uh, come over. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I, I've got a problem. Actually, this problem has been for some time. Mm. And as you know, I'm a medical officer, so I meet lots and lots of patients. Of variety of ailments, yeah. but many of them, I realize, they tend to internalize this idea that they are sick because it's a punishment. Uh. They've not done something. They've been maybe not praying, or maybe they've been too busy. Mm. And when mm. something happens, yeah, yeah, they fall ill. Yeah, and they think God's punishment. Uh. I'm not sure how to handle this, yeah. you know, because for one thing, I don't have much time. Yeah. But when they do come, yeah. I'm so conflicted. Should I say anything? Mm. Should I advise them? Right. What, what right. should I do? Yeah. I suppose, really, I mean, I don't know your job, and you know what the remit of your job is, really. But if you felt it was right and appropriate, and if you did have the right time, then, then, then. Yes, of course, I think it would be good to be able to speak to them. And perhaps we can talk about what we might, the kinds of things that you might want to say to them. Other than that, I don't know if you have a chaplain at, at your, uh, uh, um, where, uh, that comes to your department, uh, to your ward or not, or to the, where this patient is. Um, they we've got some religious offices. Yeah, okay. But since I know you, I thought I'll, I'll, all I'll right, fine. seek your, your opinion okay. about that. All right, all right, all um, right. Well, I would hope that this religious office, uh, or yourself or whoever, if you were with this person and had the ability and the time to be able to talk to them, that it needs something in the terms of, first of all, whenever we want to be able to communicate with anybody, we have to make sure we have heard them first. So we can't, this is why time is usually required, we can't normally get in there immediately. It's really important that they feel that they have been heard. So what I would say is if you get that opportunity and that patient or those patients are saying to you, oh, this is, this is why Allah is, pun this is doing this to me because this is my punishment for not doing X, Y, and Z. So, when so if that's the case, I think it's all right if I... I don't have time. <laughs> that's all right. my, my main problem. I okay. don't have time and probably I don't have the, the counseling skills to okay. handle them. So I think, is it all right if I refer them to the religious offices? Well, it's the best thing as long as you, you know, you sh we're, we're confident that the religious officers will approach it in the right way. So really, um, what, what I would hope that they would do is listen first, let that patient know that they have been heard, and give space within that conversation. 
So whenever they want to be able to butt in, the patient wants to butt in, they can butt in. And then to say to them, well, what makes you feel that this is a punishment? What makes you feel it? Then that patient will go on to say, well, it's because I heard this or somebody told me that and that actually this is a purification and that's why I will get to heaven eventually and that's why I've got to be punished by it. And in, so true. Many people say like that. Yeah. Many, many of the patients yeah. say yeah. something yeah. So they've got, they've got some they've got some Islamic backing mm. to what, why they're feeling. But what I normally do, and I hope that the religious officer would probably do the same, is I would say to them, well, it is true that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that if we have patience with a, even a scratch of a thorn bush, that our sins are washed away. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we might think that, but actually this is a consolation to us that we don't suffer for nothing, right? But in terms of feeling that this is a punishment, that's not my understanding of what this hadith is about. But what I do say to, to, the, fa uh, to the patient is, well, in terms of pain and suffering, who do we feel and think were the best of people? Was it not? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Was it not all the other prophets that came before him? Did they not all suffer? That's a, a, a good point of view to turn the punishment and see it not as a punishment. Yeah. Yes, because so, the prophets suffered. Yeah, so and not just our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but other prophets. They all suffered in one way or another. But we don't think they were bad people. Yeah. We, don't, we, we, we know they were human beings, but we know that they were the best of human beings, and yet they suffered more than we suffered. So I then say to the patient that I ask, is Allah punishing them? No. In this world, we know that we're just here for a, a time, a certain time. The, the, the feeling, that the, the suffering, the pain that we have happens in the dunya, but doesn't happen in the jannah. Yeah. We're not in jannah. Yet. Yes. We're not in jannah. This world has pain. A pure baby cries. Cries. A little child falls down and hurts his knee and cries and feels pain. And a that baby, child is not punished. And that child is not being punished. What yes. sin has that child done? Right. A child will grow teeth and get pain, will get wind in the stomach and get pain. They're not being punished. We live in the world and not the Jannah. Thank you, Rahina. I'll pass that down. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Noreeni, for this conversation. How did you feel uh, coming to the chaplain and speaking to the chaplain about um, what you'd come to speak to them about? How, d how does it make you feel? Did you feel comfortable oh speaking to her? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah? Mm. Even I though I am your friend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really. In, in a role play, we're not. Yes, yeah. Yes. yeah. I mean, you, you understood where I came from. You, know, you understood where I came from. Right. Because a lot of people do have this feeling of being punished. Yes. And they don't see the wider uh, point that you're saying that the best people, that's the prophets, they suffered. Yes. And does that mean one plus one is two? Does that mean that they suffered and therefore they were bad? No. Yeah. So I think this is a point that a lot of um, re-education mm. need to be given. But of course, in a way that's... Like and what now, made you? What made? What, yeah. What, what made you want to come to the chaplain to talk about it? It's either the chaplain or the counselor. Uh huh. Okay. You know. Right. Um, since you're a chaplain, I I, I talk right. to the chaplain. But I do think, uh, if there is no chaplain, someone has to go to the counselor yeah, yeah, because doctors somewhere. don't have time. Yeah. 
you know, they've got 10 minutes or five minutes, next, next, next. Yeah. You know, so uh, a dedicated officer, either a counselor yeah. or a chaplain, to spend time Lovely. to this. Thank you. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you very, very much. That's wonderful. Okay. What time is it? The, uh, I've still got a green light, but I'd just like to know how long I've got, please. How long have I got? 30 minutes. Okay. Right. Cool. Fantastic. Alhamdulillah. So that means, we, well, well, let's go into this discussion about this last role play. So staff can go to, um, to the chaplain as well and have a chat. Now, this member of staff actually wanted to come and talk about how she could give better care. But what about the care of the staff? A lot of the staff I have that come and see me want to talk about themselves. It might be problems because their mum and dad want them to marry somebody that they don't want to get married to. It might be a problem because, actually, I'm trying to do my studies as well, but this is really, really tough and it's really hard and I don't know how to manage it. And it could be a financial thing. It could be something to do with home or anything. But the chaplain is there to give you that confidential space. And that becomes an amazing asset for a trust to have because it looks at your health and well-being, of staff health and well-being. Any comments about that last scenario? No. Fine. Well, I didn't know I had half an hour left. Oh, there is, there is. Yeah. Let's, let's use the mic so everybody can hear. Okay, uh, I just want to ask, what yeah. would be your response if the same um, question, I mean, um, I'm, I'm getting the pain because I'm being punished, but um, the one that, uh, I mean, uh, the patient is a non-Muslim, so what, the, uh, the response that you mentioned ah, is more on Muslims. Let me tell you a real story. I had only been a chaplain, oh, I don't know, six months, one year. I, I was very, very new. And uh, my children were very young at the time. They're all grown up now, but they were very young at the time. And it was about, um, about nearly three o'clock and I had to go to pick them up from school. The, my manager, who's also a chaplain, he had gone and there was nobody else there, just myself. And to the door came somebody knocking on the door and it was one of the auxiliary staff. And she said, oh, um, is there a chaplain, please? And I said, uh, I'm a chaplain. I'm just about to leave, but I can rearrange my children's school pickup because everybody else has gone now. She said, I don't know what to do. She said, there's a woman sitting in the chapel. You know what a chapel is? Yeah. There's a woman sitting in the chapel and she's on her own and she's been sitting there and she's been crying and sobbing and sobbing and crying. She said, the midwife came over to sit, uh, uh, to sit with her and she didn't want to know her. She said, I tried to go over very, very gently, but she didn't want me. And she's been in there 20 minutes and she's still crying. And I didn't know what to do, so I just came to the chaplaincy office. So I said, okay, that's fine. Took my coat back off and I put it, put it down and I went over. Oh, brothers and sisters, I was worried. I hadn't done any ministry with a non-Muslim yet. And I didn't know what she was going to talk about and what she was going to say or whatever. And my manager had gone as well. And I thought, okay, well, I'm in this job and I've got to do it now. And I went over, opened the, uh, opened the, um, I opened the doors. And there were, at the back of the chapel, there were some chairs all in a row, right at the very, very back. And she was sitting um, on, one of those, on, on one of the chairs. And I walked in, now I'm talking about about 18, 19 years ago, when Muslim chaplains, well, you'd never seen a Muslim female chaplain, um, or they didn't understand who they were, etc. And I was thinking, do you know what? I don't know how this person is even gonna feel about me. I'm colored, she's white. I'm wearing this scarf, she doesn't, and I don't think she's a Muslim or whatever. Um, she's rejected everybody else that's come to see her. So anyway, I went in 
And uh, I saw her sitting. I had my badge on. She knew I worked at the hospital. And she had, I made my du'a. And uh, she was sitting there. And I went over. Imagine she's sitting on this chair here. And I came, went over. And I didn't want to invade her space. So I came and I... sat like that and she looked from the corner she looked down she's still crying she's still crying and then after a little while I said it'll be alright she said no it won't And I looked, and she said, it's not going to be all right. Everything's wrong. I looked at her compassionately, and I didn't say a word. And I just looked at her face and her eyes and showed her my care. And then she said, Just lost my baby on the way here. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. And she said, I know I'm being punished. I know I am. And I listened. And then she said, then, then I said to her, I had to think really carefully. She's probably a Christian, but I don't know. Okay, she's come to the chapel. She's sitting facing where the cross was at the back of the room, though. And I didn't know, I didn't want to make any assumptions, didn't know anything. And I had to think about what I was going to say. And so, and I knew I couldn't proselytize and force like the first chaplain did with I, Fatima. You know, I knew I couldn't force anything, and I knew I couldn't even subtly try to tell her anything religious. And then I just said to her, I don't, th I don't think you're being punished. Because I felt that was safe. That's just saying what I felt. I don't think you're being punished. And then the woman looked up at me almost like she really wanted to believe me. And I smiled at her. And she said, I won't tell you what she said, but she went through her story. But look, she wouldn't talk to anybody. Everybody who tried to speak to her, she didn't want to talk. But alhamdulillah, she opened up. Remember that saying on one of those, that slide that we saw earlier on about being broken? And she started to speak and she shared and she told me what had happened. And she gave me the details of what had happened. And she expressed it. And once she let it all out, it was fine. She felt comforted. By the end of 20 minutes, she was even, even able to laugh with me. Not laugh and be happy, but she was able to laugh at something that we shared. And then I said to her, I've got to go uh, pick up my kids from school now, uh, but if you like, I can ask uh, my manager, who's a Christian um, uh, chaplain, to come over and see you if you want. And she said, oh, I think that would be lovely. Will you tell him I'm in room 203? And, uh, sorry, on ward 203 or whatever. And I, and I said, uh, yes, of course, I'll do that. And we parted. And that was my first experience with a non-Muslim. So I found a way of being able to say what I wanted to say without it feeling like I was pushing it on her. Because I was just saying what I felt in my heart, and I was saying it in a compassionate and caring way. Anything else?
about anything that we've done so far. Okay. There was a sister earlier on that mentioned to me about um, a verse in the Quran earlier on, and she talked about how she has difficulty with uh, patients who are talking about um, about this difficulty, uh, about believing that they are being punished. Has that answered the, pr the, the question that you had? Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Sorry? You could do it in Malay if you prefer. Can you share it or not? Nah. Okay. Fine. That's fine. It doesn't matter because it was just basically about the same scenario. That's why we did the scenario about punishment. Okay. Is there anything at all that's been in your minds that you've not understood or you've been wanting to ask but you haven't managed to ask or you don't understand and you would like to say? Is there anything else? Can I just ask you about yesterday you shared the story about the brother who was in the coma uh -huh. and you started reading Quran and then you uh. said he started shaking and can you finish telling us what happened? Oh, oh. yes, I told you that the story continued, yes. didn't I? <laughs> Okay, well, the sad, the sad bit is the first bit. Um, he did die, eventually. And all the conversation that I'd had with the wife was about how we should, how he, uh, all about Salat al and, uh, and about burial, etc. Uh, and we did that, and I helped to do that right to the end because none of the family were Muslim. So that had happened, and then... His wife, she used to call me her little angel. Every time I came in or she wanted to call me over, she'd call me her little angel. And that was lovely. And throughout those few weeks of his life, she didn't actually ask for another chaplain to come, even though she was strong in her own faith. She felt, doesn't matter, my spiritual needs are being met, met and I'm all right. I didn't hear anything back. Sometimes we never do as chaplains. We meet a person and we never see them again. Sometimes we meet a person and then we see them next week because they're back in hospital again. So we never know. So I didn't hear from her for a lot and he had died, her husband had died. And you know what? I had a call one day. And this is really extraordinary. I sometimes get a call from people saying to me, oh, it's a year since I lost my dad and you came when we, had to, when we had to turn the life support machine on and you helped us to make it easier for, it, for us to be able to, to be there when that was being done. And we're just thinking about you and just want you to know that you were a lifeline for us and, and, and just wanted to say that. And that's beautiful, it's lovely. I still don't always remember who they were or anything like that, but you, you know that about patients that you, know, you don't always remember them. There's so many we, we see, but it's a lovely gesture. This lady rang me up and she said, Rihanna, thank you so much for everything. She said, you know how much we appreciate everything you've done for us. But she said, I've, I'm, I'm stuck right now. And I wonder if you can help me, please. And I said, oh, yes, I'll do my best. What is it? Now, I don't know if this is relevant to the state here, um, but listen to the story because it's very, very interesting. The accident that was caused, the party that had, that had done the accident and, the, and her husband had died, she, was normally, she would normally have been given compensation in our system because of this death. And, especially, and that would have been very helpful. I don't know how many thousands of pounds it would have been, but whatever. <coughs> it was their fault, clearly. The, the company fault or whatever the, vehicle, the people who, bil who the vehicle belonged to. And they, uh, normally she would get compensation. They were refusing to give it to her on grounds of that he felt nothing because he was in a coma. So the reason why she wasn't getting compensation was that they said he did not suffer. The impact was very, very strong and hard, and he was taken into hospital, and he never woke up from that. So in their minds, she couldn't claim anything. That woman wasn't bothered about the money. What hurt her so very, very much was the fact 
that they didn't believe that he suffered. She went to her solicitors and she told them that my husband was in a coma, but he responded. So how can we measure what his suffering was? He responded. And they said, well, how can you prove that? And she said, well, he used to squeeze my hand all the time when I would talk to him. He used to squeeze it for telling me that he heard me. But that wasn't going to go down so well with all the lawmakers, etc., and for evidence. And she said, well, the chaplain used to come. And every time she came, he would respond to her every single time. So they wanted, so they wrote to, she said, would you, would you be witness at court that my husband responded? And I said, yes, I'd be happy to do that. Alhamdulillah, it didn't even get to that because the solicitors wrote to me and asked me to write, to answer some questions and to write the story of, or my, my statement, to write my statement of how he did respond. So I did. I wrote the story and alhamdulillah, it was accepted immediately. Yeah. The good news was that it wasn't the money that she was after. Of course, she would get the compensation. It wasn't that. It was like, that was my husband and he did suffer. And I'm suffering as well. And I wanted, she wanted them to acknowledge that suffering. Did anybody else have any questions about anything so far? About the patient? Yeah. Right, right. Okay, so we have um, uh, chaplaincy data um, at, uh, in our office. Um, everybody has their own password to be able to get online. And this is connected to the system. So the system shows us the names, etc., in certain details. Um, and then uh, we have a system where there is a place where notes can be put in about the patient, uh, patients. And then every month or at any time, we can actually click bu buttons and we can see graphs of how many patients have been visited by a chaplain, how many patients of which religion have been visited by a, a, their, a chaplain. Um, we have graphs that show even what intervention was used in that, um, in that visit. So um, there's a lot of data there that will be used for research purposes, inshallah, and is still is it at the moment. So that's what we do, and that's how we do it. Different trusts do it in different ways. Some people are not at that stage, and we used to do it all on paper once upon a time. But now, alhamdulillah, we do everything digitally. Ah, right, right, right. Now you're getting towards the expert line here now, really. Um, so we mainly train our, uh, we mainly, uh, our chaplains are normally, normally go onto training courses. They learn about those skills and those tools there, but they vary. And they vary such that people will decide whether this type of tool suits them or that tool suits them. So different trusts have different ways of doing their assessments, but much of what you saw today is the way that I assess the situation and I do it like that. But if I felt I needed to have uh, some kind of tool or assessment, then, that, then that's what I would be able to, do, to use as well. So there are different things and a variety of them. In the children's hospital, the tools are very, very different. You're speaking to young children or teenagers. So we have lots of different types of activities that they can use to express their spirituality. Some of it is in coloring and toys and beads and different ways, but there are those kind of tools that we can also use as well. But that's another subject and it's uh, getting more specialized, but it's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Do you ever experience a compassion fatigue because you handle a lot of, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So one thing that we've not been able to talk about much at all is about caring for the cell, for the, for the chaplain. I mentioned it yesterday a little bit, but um, 
what we have to do, what we do ha have, is what we call um, uh, supervision or reflective practice. So um, I run them every six weeks and a group of us will sit together, we do a group one. I also go for my personal one uh, to do a one-to-one. -one. We also can share between chaplains at any time, whoever we want to talk to. And sometimes not even the same religion, but we can still share what we need to be able to share. Personally, I find it so brilliant when you can go to somebody who's of your same religion and you can share that with them because they understand without you having to explain things, um, etc. If I didn't have that, it would be terribly hard. Um, so, supervision is the answer for that. Before, but before that, when before I had supervision, the thing that I would do, which I still do as well, is talk to Allah. Go back to the prayer room particularly, speak to Allah, talk to Him about what's happened, and most of the time, I will say, Ya Allah, Oh Allah, I've just been and seen this patient, and I said this, and I know that Allah knows because he was there, but I've just said this, and oh Allah, I'm not sure it was the right thing to say. Oh Allah, please Allah, take away anything which was not good. And oh Allah, let them only remember and be affected positively by that which was good. Oh Allah, please guide me and help me that I might be able to do only the best thing which you understand to, to, to be the best. So I will do all of that, and after that, alhamdulillah, I find a lot of release relief from that because I've now kind of like put it in Allah's court so they said I've done what I can do please now make it right there's another question from over here I think was there it's, it's been answered oh good all right uh, yes uh, how do you balance your work as a chaplain and your family and my family mm, gosh I married a very very patient man wow. <laughs> alhamdulillah Allah bless him um, my husband has always supported me in everything I want to be able to do. We're both active workers in Islam and we have different hats actually. Chaplaincy is only one of my hats. Um, so it's wonderful that, you know, he also feels that it's important that I do this. So Alhamdulillah, I've got that support. Um, the, when the children were very young, it was hard and I only worked part time, but I would just have to juggle life just like everybody else juggles life. At the end of the day, we have to give certain things up when we prior prioritize and decide that, okay, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to get to, so I'm going to do this. And actually that has got to go because I can't cope with the both. Um, so I will do that. I felt very, very much privileged and honored when I first became a Muslim chaplain. I could not believe that Allah was giving me a job that I was going to get paid for when the barakah in this work is so great. You know, that was just absolutely amazing for me. And um, so to, to do that, it also meant that actually, spiritually, hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, I'll be doing religious work, a lot of it will be religious and spiritual, so that's going to keep me going as well. Finding the balance, ah, la, 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 la. Ah, um, is a really, really tough thing. Finding the balance has always been a tough thing. Whenever I think, ah, found the balance, something else happens. And that's life. And then we go looking for another balance. So, I don't know if I've cracked it. I'm not sure I'm very, very good at it. But I'm still here and I'm still carrying on as much as I can. Was there another? Yeah. Um, is there any counselors in your hospital? The reason that I want to ask is yeah. because some of the standard of practice um, mm -hmm. in the hospitals here in Malaysia mm -hmm. is... Um, correct me if I'm wrong for the others, um, but for like for my department, so I work in a department of psychiatry. Mm -hmm. So one of the most common things they would do is, you know, if you you're presented with a patient, mm -hmm. and then um, and then the patient said something about um, social difficulties, social welfare officer. Yeah, refer. you've got yeah, so refer a social welfare mm -hmm. officer. Um, you know, and then maybe they sense like there's a questions about religion or questions about um, being. So it's like okay, religious officer, the ustas, right, right, right. and then it's like oh, you know, having difficulties about emotions. A counselor, yep. so you know it's like very uh, compartmentalized, um, and then and the answer is yes. Yeah, so you do have counselors. Yep, yep, so yep. how do you differentiate that role between your role and a counselor? Because my counselling that you've seen is very basic counselling, but it's what we call pastoral counselling, and it's not sessional. In counselling, you will have an appointment made, you will have often a beginning, a middle, and an end. 
You might have sessions which might be up to six sessions before you finish completely. Could be only three, could be ten, depending on what agreements are. There are often things that you work through in counselling as well. So you're going from step to step to sort of uh, evaluate and see where the patient is and what steps need to be taken. There are different models of counselling in terms of using different skills and different tools. And it all depends on how the patient manages with those. So it's quite a different thing. It's time limited. So the patient knows that, oh, okay, 55 minutes time or whatever it is, that's it. The buzz is going to go off all the time it's time and it's finished. My time's up. I've got to go now. Chaplain's is not like that at all. It's about the moment and about that time. We have patients seeing us in the, you know, in the strangest of places that you don't expect. A lot of it might be by the bedside, but it might not be. They happen just like that. Or you might make an arrangement, or the nurse might say, I've called the chaplain, she says she'll be here at 3 o'clock. So you know that she's going to be here, but you don't know whether she's going to be there for 10 minutes or for 2 hours. The boundaries are completely different in chaplaincy, and we have, a, we have to have our boundaries too, but they're different from a counselling uh, uh, from, from session. So, when I, like for example, I had... Um, um, uh, the women's hospital, I see lots of baby deaths, and um, one, uh, especially miscarriage. And the one example is a mother not getting over her miscarriage. And she um, comes to see me afterwards, maybe a month later, and we sit and I give her an hour. Uh, and this is part of my pastoral counselling as a chaplain. But my manager's not going to accept that I can keep on doing that for that one patient because I've got so many other patients to go and see. But in counselling, she can make arrangements to see somebody for a number of times or whatever. So that's when I make a referral and I say, um, have, you do, uh, have you considered going to, and I give her a card or whatever, and, they mo and move them on. Does that answer your question? So how does a, uh, like a, any, like a medical officer or a doc uh, like doctor know whether they want to refer to a chaplain or refer to a counsellor? You've got to understand the differences. So, so the doctors will know? Yeah, they have to. So all of our staff are taught in mandatory training when anybody comes, whether you're a consultant or whether you're a cleaner or whether you're a kitchen staff, we all have mandatory training. And in mandatory training, we are expected to learn everything about the hospital and its services and facilities so that we can make the right referrals and we can do the right things. So you have to learn about it when you start your job in the hospital. Yeah. Not everybody understands exactly what we do because we're only giving them a little snippet. But then we give leaflets and we give information about what we do so that people know about it, inshallah. And we continue to try to help people. We also have our advertisements on the, on the t hospital televisions about chaplaincy and about anything else that people might want to um, access. Any other questions? What time is it? That amber, oh, it's Amber. Five minutes? Three, two. Anybody got a last burning question? No? Oh, okay. Sorry. Can the patient self-refer themselves? I mean, um, they saw you anyway and they just call, that, call you uh, uh -huh. to talk to you. Can they? Self-refer. Self Can they self-refer themselves to check Oh, in? yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. Yes. I think that's a, a nice time to sort of like stop now. And maybe I should say my goodbyes properly now, inshallah. Because you're not going to ask me to come back again tonight, are you? <laughs> no. No. Alhamdulillah. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, alhamdulillah. It's been such a pleasure being with you. Thank you for having me. Please forgive me for my faults, my mistakes, my errors. And if I have caused anything, any offense to anyone in any way, then I really beg your pardon and I ask you to forgive me as I ask Allah to forgive me too. So I hope, inshallah ta'ala, that it's been beneficial for, for you what I have been able to share with you. So Allah bless you all and I ask you please pray for me and my children and my husband. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Good job.
Okey, itu dia uh, seminar sukarelawan hospital kebangsaan dengan tema kita satu keluarga satu sukarelawan yang akan diadakan pada 24 Mac. Minta maaf ya tadi uh, silap pembetulan 24 Mac hari Ahad di Auditorium Fakulti Perubatan UPM yang akan diresmikan oleh Uh, TPM kita yang berbahagia Datuk Seri Dr. Wan Aziza. Jadi semua yang berkelapangan dijemput hadir untuk menyertai program seminar kita. Yang Waktu masa adalah 8.30 hingga 5 petang. Sesiapa yang berminat boleh register dekat uh, pihak urus setia petang ni. Uh, for our Philippines member, <laughs> it's for volunteer uh, seminar. Okay, next. Okey, ini uh, satu lagi bengkel hospital mesra ibadah yang memang kita pihak kita anjurkan. Uh, tarikh seperti tertera di skrin, kita telah sediakan tarikh yang akan datang adalah pada 23 dan 24 April yang terdekat. Uh, kita segregatkan, uh, kita buat umum yang lepas terbaru pada 26 dan 27 Februari dan yang akan datang ini adalah untuk HMI kejururawatan jadi sesiapa yang berminat uh, para jururawat boleh terus hadir uh, boleh terus daftar dahulu dengan pihak urus setia nombor telefon tu WhatsApp pun boleh juga iaitu 019 238 1007 Uh, dan seterusnya tarikh-tarikh berikut mengikut uh, unit yang telah ditetapkan iaitu dialisis, pentadbiran, fisioterapi, doktor dan pakar umum kejurawatan. Uh, sebab kita dah belajar untuk dua hari ini, spiritual support bukan hanya kejurawatan tapi seluruh kita uh, bertanggungjawab untuk memikul role tersebut. Ya. It's all about care and the smile yang seperti kita belajar. Jadi insya Allah untuk uh, dapatkan lagi lebih dikit detail pengisian hospital mesra ibadah, uh, tuan-tuan puan-puan dialu-alukan untuk menyertai seminar kami. Okey, tanpa membuang masa, uh, saya ingin menjemput Dr. Ishak Mas'ud uh, untuk menyampaikan uh, slot terakhir kita pada petang ini yang bertajuk What's Next? Uh, jadi apa kesinambungannya uh, and together Dr. Ishak will deliver a closing speech insyaAllah petang. Persilakan. Uh, terima kasih. Uh, thank you uh, Sister Bartiah. Um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin. Salatu wassalamu ala astrafi anbiya wa mursalin wa ala ahli wa sahbihi ajma'in. Uh, hadirin hadirat. Uh, Brother Sister Sislam, I think Uh, we almost completed our uh, two days task. Uh, I think my presence in front of you is a bit anti-climax actually. Yeah? Uh, really to tell you the truth. Yeah? Rasanya uh, tak boleh sesuai. Tapi saya kena juga lah pada sini sebab saya juga sebagai pengusi yang telah uh, meletakkan ni. Yeah? I think Sister Rehana has uh, given such a very detailed, extensive and Well, I wouldn't be able to really uh, say no more than uh, very fruitful uh, uh, experiences uh, with a sincerity uh, come from her heart and something which I have not myself learned or rather been exposed before. Uh, I hope you agree with that. Agree? Uh, okay. So, uh, as we probably see, uh, well, the, 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 the topics uh, or rather the... the The theme of our uh, seminar is towards a better healthcare services. Towards a better healthcare services. That's what we want. Yeah. Uh, whether we are in the government or in the private sector, in other departments, uh, wherever we are. Uh, uh, since all of us are Muslim, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are the best ummah. We are the best ummah, the chosen people. The best creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And I think uh, there is no doubt That we must and we should do the best And Ustaz uh, Zuramli said uh, Yesterday uh, We do it with passion 
yeah, we do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's, uh, I think, uh, something that we have to uh, really uh, seriously think, seriously ponder, uh, retrospectively, and in the future, what we're going to do. Uh, jadi uh, saya hanya uh, saya rasa sebelum saya tutup ni uh, saya nak tanya sikit lah I would like to ask anybody would like to say anything for the the, the program yeah, before I before I show some slide related to the Ibadah Friendly Hospital which I have not finished it yesterday anybody want to say anything siapa nak cakap apa-apa okey je yeah? anything ataupun nak balik lah yeah? tengok jam je ya yeah? Anything? Any comments to be shared? Senyap semua ini. Ya? Serius mana nak balik tu. Ya? Okay, uh, kalau tak ada, uh, I think there are, there are few things that probably uh, yang kita kena lihat. Uh, uh, Ibadah Friendly Hospital is a program for us, you know, for us. And we want to reflect it to the passion uh, in our daily work, in our daily life, uh, even at home, the Kauma. Uh, semalam saya sedikit, uh, I didn't mention very much about the culture. Yeah, so the culture, for example, the culture of smile dan salam, salam dan senyum. Yeah, something's very simple, uh, which I think uh, all of us should uh, adopt and become part and parcel of our. Uh, our life, yeah? it become agenda uh, in our life. And as uh, Ustaz Zoramli said, uh, I think it was discussed by Sister Shima uh, with regard to the uh, certain habits that we must follow yeah? as a Muslim in order to translate the uh, spiritual support, uh, the, 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 the beauty of Islam in our life. For example, uh, the uh, recitation or saying of Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, ya, Alhamdulillah, ya, and pray to Allah, and all those are the basic things that we need to say and we need to practice it and remember. Uh, when we do the, when we do and uh, uh, go for work, ya, it is, should be part of our ibadah. Ya, it's not uh, what we call uh, bekerja cari makan. Ya, so I think... Uh, uh, I think those are the few things that I would like uh, to mention because I don't think that is uh, the right thing to appropriately uh, show you uh, many slides. Uh, and I really hope, uh, I really hope uh, that uh, coming to this meeting is not just simply uh, uh, getting some CV point or CME point, uh, but uh, whatever that we have learned, uh, we need to apply, we need to be part and parcel. Uh, to become part of our life, to become part of our culture, yeah, the culture that Islam has uh, given us, shown us, yeah, and uh, the passion to have the patience, the passion to have the passion, and to have other people, and to show the rahmah of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to the ummah, yeah, as Allah says, as Islam is uh, the the the, the uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a mercy to the humankind and to the world. So that's uh, I hope. No, uh, some of the tips, some of the the, the uh, what we have learned from uh, Sister Rehana uh, is something that's you know very very uh, valuable, uh, so-called invaluable, and we need to to uh, be uh, convinced and be committed and to understand and to know, and we must be istiqama, and I hope uh, those uh, point those things that we have learned. And uh, when we leave this hall, we will forget it, you know. And uh, those will be very, uh, very unfortunate if uh, we do such a thing. So I think, uh, again, uh, on behalf uh, of the uh, committee, uh, Academy of uh, Ibadah Friendly Hospital, uh, Al Islam Consortium Hospital Islam, uh, and also uh, with the collaboration of uh, Jakim uh, and. Uh, uh, we would like to thank uh, all of you. Yeah, without your presence, uh, without your participation, uh, the seminar uh, will not be able to be held. And of course, uh, to Sister Rihanna, uh, she just started her, her task in, in uh, Malaysia with us—a uh, two-day task. 
And tomorrow she will have a dinner talk, and on Thursday she will have a long day uh, with us. Uh, and the discussion on the curriculum or the uh, program for certification of the uh, spiritual support program or hospital Mr. Ibadah program. And then, we, as I said yesterday, we fly to Kuantan for sharing. Now we call it a road show, you know, Kuantan, and then uh, come back. Uh, on Sunday, we have the seminar on volunteerism, hospital volunteerism. And then on Sunday night, we fly to Kotovaru uh, to share with the Kalantanese people in Kotovaru, USM. And then she come back, uh, inshallah, uh, on uh, Sunday night. And then uh, she'll be flying to Aceh, inshallah, yeah. Uh, for a visit to Aceh, uh, three, three, four nights, I think, in Aceh, inshallah. So I think uh, I would like to thank uh, all of you, uh, to all the committees uh, who have uh, made these seminars uh, uh, in a manner which I think that has been run uh, smoothly. Uh, Time-wise, uh, we uh, miss a bit, and uh, some misunderstanding, or the unfortunate thing, our sister uh, Fauzia, uh, YB Fauzia, could not come. But I think that doesn't matter very much because the fact that most importantly we get uh, the uh, message from Sister Rana and the rest uh, on uh, issues uh, pertinent to the Ibadah Friendly Hospital. And I'm sure and I hope uh, we are here and when we go back we become the ambassador, the one who will apply and will practice and will share with other members of fraternity on the uh, Ibadah Friendly Hospital program. And the needs to apply it, the necessity to apply it, the way forward is for us to have a system, a paradigm shift that not only we treat patients in a very segmental manner, but we treat them in a holistic manner, in line with what Islam asks us to do. So again, uh, thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, some of my staff uh, you know, are here uh, almost uh, 12 hours a day and preparing it. And I think, inshallah, we pray to Allah all their hard work and their, their sacrifice, only Allah's blessings and barakah. Uh, will be given to them, inshallah. So again, uh, on behalf of the committee, if there are shortcoming, many shortcoming, I know, yeah, but definitely the foods are good, yeah. Uh, and uh, we apologize for the inconvenience that uh, have been caused. And inshallah, yeah, please, uh, you will be updated on our uh, program, inshallah. And uh, please join us and uh, invite other people, other people, the doctors, uh, the senior consultant. That there are new things uh, around, and not only in their own uh, field, but there are certain more important things that is uh, to gain and to achieve mardatillah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, again, uh, uh, we would like to, uh, to close this ceremony or this program uh, by the last word. Wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.